as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this people, with the people of this generation, and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented of the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. We are continuing our study through the Gospel of Luke as we've been since the beginning of Emmaus a year ago, going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we find ourselves this morning in a very interesting text. The words of Jesus, always interesting. Just kind of praying about this text and what perhaps the Lord would have for us here this morning. I started thinking of a question. And that is, have you ever had an experience in your life where someone has had to confront you because something was off in your life. Have you ever had someone come up to you and just, just speak about an issue that you're dealing with that they've seen in you? And, and perhaps at first that confrontation made you feel um, humiliated, made you feel shame. Maybe it even infuriated you. But later you realize that that confrontation about an error in your life actually worked to help you. It actually bettered you in the end. Someone has put it this way as it concerns rebuke. Rebukes are like a hot drink. They sting at first, but soothe in the end. Solomon, when he talked about speaking honest words, even hard words, he said in Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Now I say that because the words in front of us are some more hard words from Jesus. And I don't like to teach sections where I know there are hard words because people don't like hard words. Actually, there's an old saying that says, I think one of the old Puritans said it, that hard words create soft hearts and soft words create hard hearts. So I would say that, that as we process these hard words from Jesus, that we remember that this is all under the umbrella of his love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so if this morning you're stung, it's not me trying to sting you. Your wife didn't call me last night. I don't know anything. I didn't get a phone call or email from your parents or from your roommates. I don't know anything but what I know. And I know that we're in this text. And I'm just praying that God would allow you to receive this as the way Jesus intended it. And so Jesus speaks these hard words. But notice it says in verse 29 something very interesting. Something sort of uh, paradoxical, if you would. It says, as the crowds increased... Jesus said. Now, this isn't the time to speak hard words. As the crowds increased, speak soft words with a big whitened smile and tell people, God loves you and he's got a great plan for your life. That's what you say when the crowds increase. You don't put it into like high gear and go hard word style. But Jesus is not trying to win a popularity contest. Jesus is not politically correct. He speaks straightforwardly 
and he rebukes them, speaks hard words to them because he loves them. People that I love, people that you love, were willing to say the hard stuff to. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. There are very few people that will come into your life that will love you so much that they will wound you and risk their own reputation in causing pain to ultimately help you get better. Jesus speaks hard words. Notice the hard words that he speaks. I mean, first line of his sermon. These people are in error. Verse 29, he says, this is a wicked generation. I mean, you imagine me starting my sermon off that way? Good morning, everybody. You are wicked. Let's pray. (laughs) First line in the sermon, opening statement. This is a wicked generation. And when Jesus uses this word wicked, he uses the most extreme form of it in the Greek language. The Greek word here is paneros and is the word that's used to describe Satan. So if Jesus looks at the generation and says, you are wicked the same way the devil is, that's not a compliment. That is hard words. Actually, this word paneros in the Greek language, one of its meanings could be degeneracy from original virtue. When you think about the devil and you think about the audience to whom Jesus was speaking, human beings, specifically Jews living in the Middle East, at the time where prophecy was being fulfilled for Jesus was in their midst, he's saying, you have degenerated from your original virtue. As Satan fell from his original created virtue, so the people in the land of Israel at this time had degenerated from their original virtue. And so Jesus comes out with the gloves off saying hard words, you are wicked. And it's amazing that he speaks these hard words to this particular group of people, this particular generation. This wasn't a particularly wicked generation, at least as we count wickedness. Now, if Jesus came to the United States of America or or, or this present age, the 21st century, and said, you are a wicked generation, we would not be surprised. For this generation is full of corruption and injustice and pride and materialism and idolatry and pornography and abuse and sexual deviance. But the generation to whom Jesus said, you are wicked was actually exceptionally God-conscious, exceptionally moral, exceptionally rigid as it concerned heeding the law. And Jesus says, you're wicked. Now, Now, how could he say that to them? I can see how he'd say it to us, but how could he say it to these religious people? Well, notice the accusation, the statement in which Jesus said, you're wicked and here's why. Now, we're thinking like, all right, what'd they do, right? Like, like, you know, I mean, you're sitting, you overhear a conversation, the boss closes the door and he tells one of your coworkers, you are wicked and here's why. You're like, ear to the door, like, I wonder what he did, right? Nothing, this gotta be some shady stuff here, some scandal up in here. So he says, you are wicked, but, but notice what he says, surprisingly. He says, um, you are a wicked generation for this reason. You ask for a sign. You're like, that's the reason? Real? That's really anticlimactic. I was reading some really juicy stuff. They're wicked because they ask for a sign? You know, Jesus actually said something very indicting against this generation. In, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 and 26, he said to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, He said, you are clean on the outside of the cup, or he says, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside also will be clean. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm seeing beyond facades, whom you would call wicked, the prostitute, the harlot, the tax collector, the immoral man. Jesus didn't call them wicked. They're sinners. They need to repent. That's why I came. To those who have put a facade, Jesus said, you're actually more wicked. Because here's what you do. You clean the outside of the cup, but the inside's still dirty. It's how my kids do dishes, you know? You go get that old cereal bowl, you're like, oh, somebody wasn't scrubbing. 
there's still dried cereal inside of the bowl. Like, come on. You just ran it under hot water and cleaned the outside. The outside isn't the dirtiest part of the bowl. You need to scrub inside. And Jesus said, you're clean outside. But on the inside, you're still full of death. You're full of, of disease. You're full of, 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 of things that make you wicked. You're wicked, Jesus said to them, because you seek for a sign. Now here's the problem. Remember that this is one continuing story. We, we finished part of the story last week, but this all was triggered by an event that took place up in verse 14 of this chapter. And that is, Jesus saw a man who was possessed with a devil, one that the Bible describes as he was a mute devil. He was one that caused muteness. And Jesus exercised the demon out of this demon-possessed man, this mute man, and he started speaking. And you remember what happens, the crowd reacts to Jesus' miracle. And, and we talked about last week, there were three main responses to the exorcism that Jesus did for this demon-possessed man. Uh, some were amazed. Look over at verse 14, it says, the crowd was amazed. Some people were like, wow, look at what he did. But there were others who were opposed. They questioned the source of his power. We talked about that last week. Some said, verse 15, by Beelzebul, the prince of the demons, he's driving out demons. He's doing this work by Satan's power. And, and we talked about last week some of the implications for that. But then there's this third group to whom Jesus uh, spoke, and, and they reacted this way. Some of them were unsure. Look at verse 16. And this is the group who he's predominantly talking to in the conversation we're having right now. Verse 16 those were, these were they who sought a sign. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. So Jesus says to them, you're asking for a sign that's wicked. Now why is it wicked to seek for a sign? What they're essentially saying to Jesus is we don't believe in you and it's your fault. You haven't proven yourself enough. You haven't done enough. It's your fault that we're not believers. So we don't believe because you haven't showed us a sign. And last week we talked about the one thing God is asking from the universe, from all human life, is that we believe on Jesus. And that's the one thing they wouldn't give him. The one thing he's asking is the one thing they wouldn't do. We won't believe until you do more. So do a magic trick. Prove yourself. Show a sign. Let's see your resume. We don't know if you're really who you say you are. And Jesus says, that's wicked. The crazy thing about them looking for a sign is the fact that when we started this story, we just saw Jesus did something amazing. He cast a demon out of a mute man. And they're like, show us a sign. He just did. And, and the question I often have for people who say, you know, before I believe in Jesus, I need to know more, see more, believe more. And, and, and here's my question for people when they're holding out and not believing in Jesus. When is enough going to be enough? You'll keep seeking for signs. But he's shown you enough. The world that you live in, he made it. He made you. He gave us Jesus. He raised him from the dead. He gave us the Bible. What more does he need to do to prove himself? When is enough finally going to be enough? You have all the proof you need to make a decision. So Jesus here says, I will give you one sign. I'm not going to do a magic trick in the sky because really, You'll never believe if you're not ready to believe now. But here's the one sign I'll give you. Note verse 29, the sign of Jonah. For verse 30, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Now in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus speaks a bit further about the sign of Jonah. Note in Matthew chapter 12 verse 40, Jesus said this, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so, so what Jesus is saying here, you want a sign. 
I'm giving you one. What I'm about to do is going to be reflected in what you saw in Jonah. And, and we heard Matthew tell us that in the same way Jonah was in the belly of that great fish, so too Jesus is going to be in the heart of the earth and he's going to come out and say, I beat it. I was swallowed and I beat it. I came out. Now, a few things for you to consider as we consider how is the ministry of Jesus reflected in the ministry of Jonah? Because, I mean, I don't know if you've read the story of Jonah, but I kind of get the impression he wasn't that great of a dude. God said, go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish, which is in the exact opposite area of the world. That's Monte Carlo right there. He's like, I am not going to Iraq, which is present-day Nineveh. I'm going to Monte Carlo on a carnival cruise ship, and I'm going to have a margarita and forget all those Ninevites. God said, go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. You know the story. He gets cast overboard, swallowed by a great fish. When he finally gets to Nineveh, he's not a real happy camper. He literally marches through the center of the city of Nineveh with an eight-word message, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. The reason that they believed Jonah is because he was a walking picture of the judgment of God. They're like, if that... If that's what God does to people who don't obey. He was the product of the gastric juices of a whale or a great fish. He was probably stark nude, no hair on his body, bleached white, a phenomenal looking human being. Just basically a naked albino walking through the streets of a wicked city yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Yet for, and you're like, and then Jesus is like, that's what I'm like. There, there's some comparison. And, and, and what Jesus is saying is, is some of the things in the ministry of Jonah are similar to my ministry. So here's a few things for you to consider as we compare Jonah to Jesus. How do these compare? Well, first of all, Jonah was swallowed by a big fish, just as Jesus was swallowed by the grave. Jonah's ministry looked like it had come to an end, and so too, when Jesus was buried, it looked like his ministry had come to an end. Jonah miraculously was delivered from certain death. It looked like he was dead. But even more, Jesus was miraculously, miraculously raised from actual death. And then finally, Jonah's deliverance ushered him into a very powerful ministry. 120,000 men repented of their sins when a naked albino preached a four, uh, 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed. Jesus' resurrection has inaugurated him as king of the known universe. So Jesus says to this religious group, that's the sign. That's the sign to this generation, and that's the sign to all generations. So if you're living in the 21st century and we're hearing this, guess what? Jesus is not going to do anything else to prove himself to you. He's done what he's going to do. He rose from the dead. Period. Enough said. Enough information had. We could talk on and on and on about the historical reliability of the bodily physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I could recommend many great books to you. People who have done scholarly difficult work. Men like Lee Strobel who have proven from the place of being a non-believer in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ have asked hard questions of smart men with more degrees behind their name than a thermometer and came out saying this is historically true. But, but, but beyond that, beyond that, Jesus said, the sign that this generation gets is the sign of the prophet Jonah. I resurrected from the dead. That's the great proof. That's the one sign. That's the only thing needed to believe. But then Jesus speaks of a day of reckoning for this generation. Look at some of these very difficult words that Jesus says to this generation that he's speaking to here and I believe to this generation as well. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now notice something greater than Solomon is here. Not someone, something greater than Solomon. 
Solomon was a king of perhaps the greatest dynasty in all of Israel and perhaps all of world history. He was the richest, wisest man that ever lived. And Jesus says his kingdom was great. His wealth that he had amassed was great. The temple that he built was the greatest. But something greater than Solomon is here. That is, a new king who's better than Solomon, wiser than Solomon, and richer than Solomon, wealthier than Solomon. Excuse me for my bad grammar. You teachers out in the audience are like, oh, he just said rich. You need to come to my English class. Wealthier than Solomon and his kingdom is a greater kingdom than Solomon's kingdom ever was. The queen of the south will rise up and speak out against this generation at the judgment. Verse 32 the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with gen- this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now again, something, not someone, something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Jonah. A greater prophet. Jonah was a prophet. Did you guys ever see that veggie tale? Jonah was a prophet. Mm-mm. It really couldn't sound like um, Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, but Jesus is a better prophet. Jonah came out of the belly of a great fish. Jesus came out of the grave. What Jesus did in in, in his prophetic ministry and in his miraculous escape from death, resurrection from death, is better than Jonah. So essentially, Jesus is saying, at the end of the age, at the judgment, for that generation, there will be two that took the stand. The queen of the south. Now, who is the queen of the south? In 1 Kings chapter 10, we hear of the story of this woman who 1 Kings chapter 10 tells us was the queen of Sheba. Now Sheba um, is, is modern day Yemen, uh, down at the southern point of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, just below Saudi Arabia, down there by the sea. And, and, and it was a place so far off in those days that, that note it says that she came from the ends of the earth. And the queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth because she had heard of the renown of this great king, one named Solomon. She came to seek out the wisdom of Solomon. And she, a pagan Gentile and a woman, is going to stand up in judgment against this generation for this reason. She traveled very long, very far, at her own expense to hear the wisdom of one who is less than Jesus. And she was a pagan. She wasn't a worshiper of Yahweh. She lived afar off. She was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. And she was a woman. And all that, she said, Jesus said, she will rise up against this generation because you have no excuse. I am right here and you have done nothing to believe in me. The men of Nineveh will rise up They will take the stand against this generation at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. Because Jonah shows up to Nineveh, carried by a big fish, gets barfed up on the beach, preaches his message of judgment, and the men of Nineveh repent at the preaching of Jonah. And Jesus says, and I'm greater than Jonah, and you have not repented at my words. You have no excuse. Something greater than Jonah is here. Now, it's, it's kind of easy for us to maybe look at this group of people that Jesus was addressing and go, yeah, man, if I was alive in the Middle East as a Jew and Jesus was there, I would have been a believer. I wouldn't have been one of these, I wouldn't have been a part of this wicked generation that's seeking for a sign. I wonder at the end of the age for this generation, what people will say about us. Because we are a people born in a time and in a nation of great privilege. The United States, with all our Bibles, all our churches here in the South, all our sermons and all of our knowledge and all of our books and all of our music about the gospel, we are inundated with information about Jesus and God and the way and plan of salvation. And I wonder what generations will rise up in judgment against us. When you think about the underground church in communist China, 
how they love the word of God and it's so scarce there. They can lose their lives for having just a page of it. And they pass it around underground in secret one page at a time and they treasure it like it was gold. I wonder what they would say to us in the United States and America. Because I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of books about the Bible in my library. I've got a lot of Bibles. I've got a lot of access to sermons. I've got podcasts. I'm deleting podcasts because I can't listen to all the information I have in my phone. And yet there are a group of people who say, we love Jesus maybe even more than you. And we have less privilege. Or, or believers in Iraq, especially right now with ISIS and the terrorism over there, where loving Jesus can cost them their lives and their children's lives. Or believers in dirt poor, disease ridden, economically oppressed parts of Africa. What would they say to the United States? Rich, privileged, free to worship without fear of martyrdom or persecution. I don't know if you realize this, and I'm sure you do, but you probably don't want to meditate on it too much. Most of the world is difficult to live in. Just a few facts probably you're aware of about the way the rest of the world is living while we live with such plenty. Over 1 billion people out of the 7 billion that are on planet Earth, over 1 billion people are without access to clean water. Every seven seconds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Every seven seconds, somewhere in the world, somewhere in the world, a child under five dies of hunger. Kids dead. Many during this service will die because they can't eat. Almost 1 billion people in the world live on less than the equivalent of one American dollar a day. It's $365 a year. 40% of people, that's 2.7 billion people, 2.7 billion people in the world lack basic sanitation, which keeps us from disease and death. 1.6 billion people in the world have no electricity. I actually think that might be a good thing. I, I, never mind. Um, <laughs> just think about how much TV we watch. Almost one billion people in the world cannot read or sign their own name. One in seven children worldwide, 158 million, have to go to work every day just to survive. In lots of the world, it's hand to mouth. One day at a time. This is not about guilt. I don't feel guilty that I live in the United States of America, but I should feel accountable, responsible. That this is, this is not about guilt. This is more about a people like the ancient Jews who were given a privilege yet remained unbelieving. In contrast to a people without privilege, without knowledge, without wealth, without all that we have in access yet, they are coming to faith in Jesus Christ in mass revival. I don't know if you're aware of this, but most of the revival that's happening on the planet Earth today is not happening in the United States of America. It's happening in third world countries, all over communist countries. People are experiencing revival of biblical, historical proportions. And they don't have squat they don't have a fraction of what we got. And I wonder at the end of the age, who will stand up and said, we believed on Jesus. And we, a people of great privilege, will say, and we did not, like we should have. So Jesus further illustrates the issue of unbelief and its cause. In verse 33, he starts this very interesting couple of sentences, this interesting little vignette. Listen, he says about unbelief, he starts off this way, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, well let's start as we layer this discussion, understanding what Jesus is saying. Essentially, Jesus is saying, my message my kingdom, my truth, I have made it clear. 
and knowable. He's basically saying, I lit a lamp. I didn't hide that lamp's light. I put it on a stand. I've lifted it up so that all who want to see can see. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he shined his purpose in his ministry. He healed many lame. He cleansed many lepers. He raised dead people. He walked on water. He multiplied bread. He did many things that would all point to, hey, that's, that's the Messiah. The light of the kingdom is coming through that man. The words and the works that he spoke pointed to him. In other words, Jesus is saying, I was the one who lit the lamp, put it on a stand, so that anyone who wanted to see could see. The lamp was so bright and so visible that you would have to be blind not to see his light. And that was exactly the issue. The issue of spiritual blindness. The religious people did not recognize God in their midst. Now note verse 34. Your eye, speaking of your understanding. Now this is a metaphor. The eye is a biblical metaphor. We're not talking about the literal eye in your face. But it's a metaphor for your understanding or your heart. Your eye, your understanding, is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, when your understanding or your heart is unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. So this generation was wicked because they were blind and they were blaming Jesus for not giving them enough to see. I heard about a blind man who walked into a grocery store with a seeing eye dog. And he grabbed the dog by the leash and he started swinging the dog over his head, round and round and round and round, round and round and round. And one of the, uh, the, the clerks in the store noticed this blind man down aisle seven, you know, swinging his dog around over his head. And the clerk came down and said, sir, what's the matter? He said, oh, nothing, ma'am. I'm just looking around. <laughs> a little blind joke. Okay. No? Okay. I won't use that one again. Edit that from the notes. Um, but Jesus here is, is talking about a spiritual blindness. And what he's talking about is the issue is not about light. The issue is about sight. The issue is not, is there enough information out there for a person to make an educated decision, a belief decision, a faith decision to trust in Jesus? The light is there. There's no question. The light is there. The issue is about sight. And he's saying they didn't see because they couldn't see because they were blind. Now we might step back and go, okay, well then if they're blind, they cannot see. Therefore, why blame them? But this isn't an issue of accidental blindness. This is an issue of willful blindness. This is they don't want to see because something's unhealthy with their eye. They don't want Jesus. People don't believe in Jesus because they don't want him. And that's an honest answer. You don't believe him because you don't want him. Because he's shined enough light. That's what he's saying, not me. I put my kingdom on display for all to see, but you have decided that you don't want me. You've been blinded by hatred. So then your eyes are unhealthy and your whole body is full of darkness. So Jesus then instructs us how not to be a generation who is full of darkness, but rather how can we be a people then who are a believing people, a people full of light? Notice he concludes this way, verse 35, see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines it's light upon you. Now, when we talk about light in Scripture, you know, a lot of times the Scripture talk about light. A lot of you read places in your Bible where it talks about light. Light in the Bible is metaphoric. It's a metaphor of intellectual light, truth. Or it's metaphoric of, of, uh, of moral light. That is, is what is holy, what is right, how to live well, what is pleasing to God. And it's also a metaphor for spiritual light. That is information or, or, or being able to know and connect with God. So Jesus talks about light, and when we, the Bible talks about light, it's talking about intellectual and moral and spiritual light or rightness. Therefore, to walk in the light is to walk in truth and holiness 
and a connection with God. What does it mean then to be a person who's full of darkness? Well, biblical light symbolizes truth and holy living in connection with God. Then to walk in darkness would be to believe in lies, to walk unholy, and to be disconnected from God. And the only way a person could desire darkness more than they desire Jesus is if they are unable to see because they're blind or they are in darkness. I heard it illustrated this way. It'd be like a man in a darkened room. And on one side of him, he feels something in his hands in this dark room that's warm and furry. But then in the other hand, he feels something that's hard and cold and sharp. And, and, and so in the dark, he goes toward what is warm and furry and comforting. But then the light gets turned on and he realizes that the furry thing was the tail of a skunk. And the hard, sharp thing was a diamond. How do men love darkness? Because they can't see value in Jesus. Men love darkness because men love darkness because they, they are unable to see the exceeding worth of Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle put it this way, very apropos. In Ephesians 4.18, he said about the wicked, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Did you catch that? They are darkened in their understanding, therefore they don't believe in God. They're dark. They're separated from the life of God for what reason? Because of ignorance, but ignorance that's caused, as Paul said, due to the hardening of their hearts. Anyone who won't believe in Jesus is not like a person who's shackled in chains and gloomy darkness against their will in a prison. This is willful darkness. Jesus said in John 3, 19, the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I want to finish with us this way this morning. I believe that Jesus has maybe some hard words for some of us. And it would be better to receive whatever humiliation, whatever inconvenience, or whatever a, a, a hard word from Jesus would produce in us, be better for us to heed that now and to receive his rebuke than to play it safe and to slide back into the shadows. To so go right back to our old behavior. Because to miss moments of conviction in your life, you never know when your last possibility for healing and repentance has passed you by. None of us ever know. But the Bible seems to indicate there is a line. We know not where, a time, we know not when, that if a man will continually, repeatedly harden their heart towards God, as Ephesians 4.18 says, their heart becomes, their understanding becomes darkened. And now they not only will not, but they cannot believe. Most of us here are Christians. Most of us here do believe. But I do believe that we need to consider some of these words and some of this perhaps as it applies to us. So Jesus has hard words for three groups. I'll be brief. Number one, people who ask for a sign. Note, again, part of that crowd after Jesus drove out the demon in verse 16, they, they were asking for a sign. Again, they were saying, Look, we need more proof. We need more explanation. You owe me a sign. And Jesus, again, concludes people that looking for more signs, he says, that's wicked. And then, and then he says, of course, as we mentioned, he mentions the one sign you'll be given is the sign of Jonah, which is a picture of the resurrection. And, and basically, in their boots, they were looking forward to an event that hadn't happened yet, but we are looking backward to an event that it already, has already happened. That is the resurrection of Jesus. But whether the resurrection was future or past, Jesus saying, that's enough for you to believe. No more excuses, man. No more. The time has come. Quit hesitating, you either believe or not. What are you going to do with Jesus? 
He said, I've done everything I'm going to do. But people wait around looking for a sign. I think that is a false premise. They're looking for a sign because they don't want to believe. Just like me waiting to go running. I don't want to go running. So I'll go do dishes. I'll sweep a floor. I'll work on my sermon again. You said you probably should have. Well, maybe. I'll do lots of things because it's, it, I'm just I'm waiting for another sign. I'm waiting for another. No, I, I'm busying myself because I don't want to believe. But Jesus said, no, no, no more of that. Hard words of Jesus. To people looking for a sign. And secondly, to a people who choose darkness. Again, in verse 34, he talks about the unhealthy eye and the whole body being full of darkness. I believe that one of the most hellish things about hell is the idea of being full of darkness. Darkness is its own hell. The hell of hell is the darkness. Some people choose that darkness, but I don't think they realize what they're doing. A man by the name of Peter Kreeft wrote something I thought was very interesting on the subject of hell that I want to read to you. He says, the images for hell in scripture are horrible, but they're only symbols. The thing symbolized is not less horrible than the symbols, but more. Spiritual fire is worse than material fire. Spiritual death is worse than physical death. The pain of loss, the loss of God, who is the source of all joy, is infinitely more horrible than any torture could ever be. All who know God and His joy understand that. Now listen, saints do not need to be threatened with fire, only loss. Then he quotes C.S. Lewis. Listen to this. Think about this as it concerns the loss of living a darkened life. The hell of hell. C.S. Lewis says, Peter Kreef quoting him, All your life, an unattainable ecstasy has hovered just beyond the grasp of your consciousness. The day is coming when you will wake to find beyond all hope that you have attained it. Or that it was within your grasp and you have lost it forever. One of the major consequences about living a life of darkness and denial of God is that at the end of the day, when you end up separated from God, you will be saying for all eternity, it's nobody's fault but mine. I did not want to believe. I did not want to love him. It's nobody's fault but mine. I chose this. This was the destiny that I decided for myself. The light was there, but I willfully went blind. And all my life, there was hovering just out of my reach, ecstasy and fulfillment. And for those of us who walk in the light, one day what we've been trying to grasp for, that care on the stick, is going to finally be ours. But for those who continually, willfully walk in darkness... They will wake up one day to realize I'm never going to get what I was ultimately hoping for and aiming for because I chose darkness over light for my life. The hell of hell. The horror of darkness. But then finally, more appropriate for most of us here in the theater, Jesus speaking to a people who should live fully in the light. Here's a word for all of us. And I want to read verses 35 and 36 out of the New Living Translation because I think sometimes reading various translations can illuminate parts of a text that you weren't seeing before. And I want you to just listen. As I read verses 35 and 36 out of the New Living Translation, listen to these words because I think they're profound. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant. As though a floodlight were filling you with light. I'm struck by two things from this. First of all, this statement. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. And something to bring to prayer. 
the light that I think I have. I don't want it to be dark. Search my heart, God. Secondly, I'm struck by this phrase out of the New Living Translation, verse 36, words of Jesus. If you are filled with light, then this phrase, with no dark corners. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, this will be the result. Your whole life will be radiant. Could we describe our lives? Can I describe my life as being radiant? My whole life is radiant, and where it is not, I'm asking God, where are those dark corners? Again, the prayer of David, the psalmist in Psalm 139, we pray, search me, O God, and know my way. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I want to end by reading to you, I'm going to apply this by reading to you a prayer of corporate confession. Let's listen to this and then I'll pray. Our confession. Father, we bring to you our darkness. Those places that look like light but are actually very dim. We confess to you the times that we have said we are no murderers but have hated. We are no adulterers, but have lusted. We are not thieves, but have coveted many things. We do not blaspheme, but have murmured and complained of life which you gave. We have not denied you, but have doubted. We are not cruel, but have ignored the world's pain. Father, wherever our light has been dark. We ask for honesty, humility, and strength to change. Father, if our light is not full, then please search the dark corners. Where hatred dwells inside our hearts, reveal it. Where lust decays our deepest soul, please kill it. Where coveting dilutes contented life, please fill it. Where murmuring pollutes our mouth, please heal it. Where doubt has clouded inner faith, dispel it. Where conscience ignores the world's pain, compel it. Father, make our whole life radiant, like a floodlight in the soul. Amen.